and good afternoon and welcome to this important discussion on the upcoming uh, budget 2022. As you know, the Minister of Finance has announced that date as the 20, uh, sorry, as the 4th of October. And many of us, I'm sure, are uh, waiting with anticipation to find out what's going to happen, what are we going to get in this budget. So what the Cipriani College of Labor and Corporative Studies has done is we've put together a very, very uh, diverse panel who will try to take us through some of the things that we ought to be looking for, some of their own sectoral interests, and to guide us really as a population and to, to assist with our own understanding of what budgeting is and how it should, should go and what uh, their own views are as far as that, that is concerned. Um, what we want to do is I want to spend less time with me talking and more time with our panelists. So we're not going to go into long bios this afternoon. The bios will be placed at the bottom of the feed or in the feed under the YouTube stream. So you can look for the bios of all of our panelists there. So I wanna just tell you very quickly who we have and how we're going to run our session this afternoon. So we're going to split into two. Uh, so our first panel will have uh, Antonio De Freitas, who's the president of Tutor. Mr. Gabriel Faria, CEO of the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce, and Mr. Conrad Enel, who is the current chairman of the board of the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, our second panel, we will have Dr. Vanus James, economist, and Ozzy Warwick, general secretary of the Joint Trade Union Movement. Our process is going to be, each panelist is going to speak for a few minutes, an introductory, uh, just a few introductory comments, for us on their expectations, uh, especially as it relates to their sector and so on. We've asked uh, Conrad Enel to do a little more for us um, as we try to really make this space a teaching, a teaching space. And then we will have a discussion and, and engagement. Um, and we are opening, uh, we are open to questions from our chat. Uh, we have one hour for each, each segment, so please stay with us from five until until seven. And I've, I've put it to our first panelists that if they want to stay on a little longer, they're free, they're free to do to do so. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us again. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, and good afternoon to our panelists. So let's get the ball rolling. And I want to introduce firstly uh Conrad Enel to start the ball rolling for us. So thank you so very much. And let me um, at the onset say that I am extremely pleased to be associated with this event. And of course, we have distinguished panelists who would certainly add to the conversation. I want to begin with the parliament because that's where we are going to be uh, come budget day. So at the parliament, there's a process. The minister presents. And in that presentation, he is supposed to account for his stewardship. But what he's also doing is that he's asking for the parliament to approve expenditure. And that is all that the parliament is, is legally required to do, just to basically ex, uh, um, approve expenditure. And this is the expenditure that comes out of the consolidated fund, and that is what we, we refer to as public funds. A new feature of the, of the budget process is the question of examination of each line of expenditure by the opposition, and they go through a committee with that and you have that conversation taking place. So that takes place. And then the minister um, decides when the budget debate will begin shortly thereafter. And part of the reason for that is because when he gets into the parliament, the first thing he does is that he lays a number of supporting documents. And these documents actually is the basis under which he has arrived at his conclusion. So for example, you will hear him say, uh, Madam Speaker, I wish to relay the following documents. And usually it is the review of the economy, the state enterprises investment program, the social sector investment program, the public sector investment program, the public sector investment program, Tobago, the estimates of expenditure and the estimates of revenue. This then is the package of the documents that are to be used 
in conjunction with the budget statement that he that, that he presents um, so that one gets some understanding of exactly what it is he's trying to do. So the, the, the documents are as follows. The budget documents really deal with accountability and transparency or, or simply compliance with the law. Because when you look at them, it sets out what was accomplished and what he plans to do. Um, insofar as the process is concerned, once the budget is delivered, within that document, policy is expressed and policy determines the wealth or otherwise of the nation. But before he gets to the parliament, there are a number of things that he does. The first thing he does, for example, is about six to eight months before, he sets out the call circular. And what this call circular does is that it gives to every single permanent secretary in every single ministry some very specific instructions. It says, tell me what you have done last year with the money that I have given to you. Tell me how much money you want. Tell me why you want it. Give me a plan for what you plan on doing. And I will consider what you would get in that context. That is normally done with the Minister of Finance in consultation with the Budget Division of the Ministry, as well as the Ministry of Planning, because the Ministry of Planning also has a role that has to do with capital expenditure, or what we refer to as PSIP, Public Sector Investment Program. There are two levels of expenditure in the budget. One that has to do with recurrent expenditure, that is run salaries and wages and running uh, the day-to-day -day operations. And then the one that has to do with capital expenditure, which is to create economic activity or new activity for uh, expansion of the economy. Usually there used to be stakeholder consultations. I'm not sure if it was done this year, but it used to be a feature of the process where each interest group will come to the government and say to them, this is what I would like to see for my sector. And the government in some instances will say yes, no, look at the cost and see if it is something that can happen. After all of that, he has some very hard choices to make. He makes those choices, um, he does the delivery, he goes to the parliament and we get the whole question of implementation. That's the framework that really and truly sets the tone uh, for the budget discussion. And in a lot of instances, I hear a lot of commentators asking for information that is currently available. It is just that in some instances, nobody knows where to find them because the documents are large, they're voluminous, but they are very detailed. Um, let me stop here because I just wanted to create the frame for the exercise. The other Parts of it, I will come back to later on to answer the first question that you have asked. So I just wanted to present that as the framework in which the minister gets to the stage where he makes the presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Conrad, for, for that. Um, giving us some proper grounding there in terms of simply put, you know, what is what are the mechanical processes involved in this presentation that we're going to hear on Monday? Uh, so I want to move on now very quickly to Gabriel Faria, and the floor is the floor is yours to bring your opening remarks. After you're still muted. And, uh, sorry, thank you. Yeah. So it's always interesting when you sit in a panel like this because, of course, each of us view this from a much different perspective. Um, by the way, Conrad, yes, we will ask to submit our recommendations. We have become accustomed, like, like everyone else, that we know when we submit our recommendations, and I've seen Dr. James' recommendations, I've seen everyone's recommendations, we know that what's going to actually happen is, is a little bit different. I think it's important we understand that the budget is a bookkeeping exercise because it, it really it really should sit behind some master strategic plan. And as a, I, I grew up in manufacturing over the years, working and, and, and being very heavily involved in exports. And as an example, I just want to give one tiny example. As an example, the government has, has a strategic plan to increase exports and to increase capital investment. However, in the budget, 
the 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 execution of that doesn't seem to tie back to the strategic part. So that that's a challenge as an interest group representing the business sector we have always had. I, the other point I'd like to raise, and I'd really like to get feedback from, from the rest of the panel on this, is we've been actually asking the government to move away from cash accounting. And the reason we want to move away from cash accounting, and I'm going to give you a, what I consider one of my excellent examples, is in 2017, I raised the fact that the government owed the private sector $6.2 billion, $6 billion in VAT, a billion dollars in um in supplier payables and another probably another half a billion dollars in uh, tax refunds. So when those budgets were presented, because of the way the country does its budget, the, the, those figures were not included as expenditure. So part of the reason we're asking for accrual based accounting rather than cash based accounting is it will provide a much more accurate picture on our expenses. Just to highlight, that $8 billion that was not paid would have reflected a reduction in eight, of $8 million in expenses. But that being said, those are, so th that's some of the things we, we, we have been asking. I will tell you, we have a number of other areas we've talked about. In this year's budget, we are talking about really supporting the, the, the smaller and medium-sized businesses. When you look at what's happening with the larger businesses, they are doing, they are doing, they have the capital infrastructure to survive. But where we are seeing the greatest challenges, and we use the term fairly broadly, the vulnerable and vulnerable being businesses and citizens. The, what you are seeing in other parts of the world is the support the, the, their governments have given the population and the business sector has actually resulted in a very strong economic um, environment. Whereas in Trinidad, the support has been a lackluster. We think that is crucial. So I, I will, as we get along, I'll raise some of the other items we have we have discussed. But we, we think the most important thing is to ensure that there is support for that vulnerable sector, both businesses and individuals, and to look at a more accurate method of cash of um, accounting, moving away from cash accounting. That's my um my input. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And, and definitely, um, I think when we get back around to the questions, I'd, I'd want to hear, and I'm sure many of us would want to hear a little more about the uh, challenges that you identified with doing a cash uh, accounting approach to the, to the budget. Um, and also that important thing of what is the strategic context in which the budget is being, is being read because uh, I think we in the pre-discussion, the point was being made, you know, there's a distinction between the political statement and the actual facts and figures um, that are read. So, so that has to be determined by something. So definitely, uh, thank you very much for those opening comments. And now uh, we turn to the, the lady of the hour, I suppose, is how I could describe our next uh, speaker. Um, we know that the teachers have been engaged in some um, some reflection today. So today we want to hear um, from the president, Antonia De Freitas, and, and how she uh, is planning to reflect on, on this budget that is coming up on Monday, 4th of, of October. So Antonia, the floor is, the floor is yours. Thank you, Akin. Good afternoon to fellow panelists. Good afternoon to viewers and listeners. I just want to piggyback on something that Gabriel said in terms of the strategic plan. Um, we are aware, and as you mentioned, there are two dimensions, political and economic or financial. And I want to tap into the National Development Strategy 2030, which is political in nature, but it's supposed to provide the roadmap for national development in order for Trinidad and Tobago to fulfill the Sustainable Development Goals of United Nations 2030. In that context then, putting it first of all in the public sector and referring to the call circulars that Conrad spoke about the PSs have to put on, we as, as the workers and as unions, as sectoral interests, we don't have an idea of what the plans and projections are to fulfill those goals nationally and internationally on a given year because you don't know what level of accountability is being provided for action and non-action. And as I said, we are not part of the planning process. 
So maybe as we look towards October 4th, the issue of planning and feedback and interaction is something that has to be worked in. I would just want to tap as well into the public sector investment program and the public sector investment program to big with specific reference to education. Last budget, the education sector received the largest allocation. However, the trickle down effect of that, the disbursement of those funds were very, very skewed. A large portion of that allocation had to go to paying arrears to contractors and other service providers that had been unpaid for years. So when you take out that 4 million or so, that's 4 million that could have been used directly channeling into the provision of education services and development. So I would want colleagues to say this for us to consider as we discussed this afternoon. We are looking at education, not just in terms of dollars and cents and expenditure, but also as an investment in our national development, both in terms of human capital development and in terms of building certain bases. The manufacturing sector is fed by skilled personnel many of whom come out of the tech box stream of the secondary schools. Yet still, the tech box students, those students doing the CVQ examinations, are some of the students who are most disenfranchised and where the least amount of funding goes towards curriculum development and training and reform. So we perhaps need to break down investment in education into different categories at different levels. Just before we came on the program, as I wrap up the intro, just before we came onto the program, we learned that there were some education professionals at the early childhood care and education level who, having not received the words of their contract renewal for so many months, were finally given three-year contracts. But mind you, that sector is part of the formal teaching service. So if we want a seamless in education, our investment has to be from the lowest level to the highest level, where we embrace everything as part of our national development strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, I could tell you that um, in particular, the connection um, between our 2030 national plan and the, the SDGs um, I am I am a hundred percent sure that we're not very clear on what that means. Um, I mean, as we speak, Ongtad is going on. Uh, the fifteenth Ongtad session is taking place in in Barbados, um, and I am I have not heard any reports in the newspaper here in Trinidad. I have not seen anything coming out from any sector that we're taking part in that. But then we'd see we we're well on the way to the 2020, 2030 development goals. So so there's a little contradiction inside inside of there. So as we, I think that we've, we've set a good, we've set a good platform. I have to say though that um, I have to behave as the moderator because some of these topics are in fact things that I myself have a, a vested interest in. So I have to make sure that I, I stay in my lane as they say and not try to become a fourth panelist uh, in the discussion. So I wanna just have us know perhaps as we continue our conversation um, I want to ask us a, a, a specific question now, um, and this has to do with the idea of consultation with stakeholders. And having been in the trade union movement myself, um, I know that we have many different ideas and concepts of what stakeholder consultation means. So perhaps I want to just ask each panelist, and then we can go in the same order, to discuss their own views on the process of consultation that we we do in fact engage in, and, and whether or not uh, you think this process is efficient or and sufficient in fact, and whether or not there's some changes and recommendations that you could make that perhaps could help us do this a little better as we go forward. So we can start with Conrad and, and we go in the same order. So, so to answer the question, you have to determine from which perspective you're looking at this from. Let me look at it from the position of the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance is going to Parliament 
to get expenditure approved for running the country. He is doing that through various ministries. So in the case of the Ministry of Education, for example, he would have asked the Ministry of Education to say to him, what do you need for the next 12 months to support a few things? When he would have sent the, 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 the Paul Circular to them, he would have asked for a number of things. He would have said, give me your numbers in the context of the government policy framework for sustainable development, that's the overarching document, the medium term policy framework, the national performance framework, the customer service delivery plan and corporate and business plan. Now, all of that information is available, but it is not available to the public. It is simply available at the level of the ministry. So that's the first piece. So that to say that there is no planning and so that that's, that's really not true. There is a significant amount of information that is available. So mm -hmm. is that when you get to specific interest group levels of consultation for delivery of goods and services? We losing. Yeah. We seem to be having we seem to be having a little a little technical problem there. Um, so, uh, Conrad, are you still there? Okay, so let's 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 move Gabriel. Maybe you could come in um, while we try mm -hmm. to get. Um, Conrad's uh, situation rectified. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I, I heard the close-up before Conrad got cut off. And I have no doubt that there are, there are numbers, and that's why I use the term of keeping exercise. I have no doubt that there are numbers that the budget is based on. So I know that these are the numbers. This is what my expenses are. I think the challenge we have as a sector is that we don't believe that there's enough consultation across all stakeholders because you, you, your question referred to consultation, correct? Okay, so what, what, we, what we really need to understand, and you know, it's interesting, you said you're in the labor movement. I've been talking to people like Michael and Zett. And when you look at the port, um, the port workers, they, their last salary increase I think it was 2013 to 20 or 2013 to 2015. While they, while that uh, uh, increase was approved, that increase has not been paid. Yeah, and and no further and no further negotiations have been made. So that that is where I see the lack of consultation, and it comes back to the weakness in the accounting method of cash accounting, because because those workers are the port. And many workers in the government system have not been paid or they have not negotiated. And I don't know what the teaching service is like, but we can we can look at that too. Because they have not been, they have not had negotiations and they have not had adjustments in salaries. In a traditional business, that would be considered a liability and it would be considered an expense with an account payable that I had to pay. So all of that money owed to the, the civil service, the port, the teachers, that's not included in our accounting. And I, I am in a group, and I have a lot of very well-based well economists, with some of the best economists in the country, and they always talk about our debt-to-GDP ratio. And to be honest with you, it's really not, it's not a real number, because the number in the budget doesn't take into account all the debt that the government owes its workers, it owes in battery funds, it owes in tax refunds, it owes its suppliers. So when you look at debt to GDP ratio, the numbers that are presented in the budget are incorrect. Um, so um, and let me hand back over to Mr. Enel, as I see he's back in. So, sorry about that. I, I don't know what happened. I was getting into political parties, and all of a sudden, I guess <laughs> somebody decided I shouldn't be talking. But, but I, I can tell you it was not on our side. I could, I could assure you it wasn't from, from my IT team. <laughs> I hear you. No, the point I was, I was trying to close off on was that, so these manifestos then go into the parliament and become policy. And that is what drives a lot of what is taking place in so far as the, the, the society is concerned. Let me, let me address one issue though. Um, all the sectoral interests have to 
find themselves either in an expenditure or in a revenue number. So if, for example, we have to incentivize the private sector to make sure that they could provide the revenue, which are really taxes, to pay for the expenditure. And in a lot of instances, the revenue is derived from income and profits, that's uh, Gabriel's activities, goods and services, that's the other side of it, um, taxes on internal trade, taxes on property, you know, nobody likes that, stamp duties. That's the first level of resources that are used to fund some of the expenditure. The other piece, of course, are things like royalties, profits from state enterprises, not expenditure that state enterprises may use in the investment stream. That's, that's not it. It is simply the profit and or the dividends and then fees and charges. And basically, those support four levels of expenditure. Wages and salaries, which is fixed. Every single month, you have to pay wages and salaries. Goods and services, you have to support the wages and salaries group so that they can get work done. Interest payment, well, that has to do with that issue. And then the whole question of transfers and subsidiaries. Now, one of the challenges we have as a society is that every time something happens additional to what is taking place, we hear the, the, the conversation around, uh, we need to put more resources into, or we need to be spending money here or there or the other. But when you look at the cost of transfers and subsidies, that is benefits that are being given to those in the society who somebody has to look after. It is so high that it is distorting the expenditure profile that we have. And, and in a real sense, if you look at the difference between revenue and expenditure, we do not have sufficient resources and therefore you have to borrow. You have one or two choices, either borrow to maintain the expenditure that you currently have or reduce the expenditure. Reducing the expenditure means people are going to get hurt. Now, all Gabriel's very um, learned economists talk the truth about how you balance these expenditure and revenue, because in business, that's what we do. The problem with a government, though, is that if it does that badly, you have social unrest in the society. And one of the negative features about the IMF and IMF programming, which we have stayed away from as a country, is that once you decide to get into an IMF program, the decisions that you do not now make, that you could make, stay home people and those kind of issues, are things that they, they mandate you to make. And they're really not concerned around social costs and social issues and those kind of things. And one of the things that drive the difference between the economics and the politics is that in order for anybody to get into government, there's a group of individuals that will support them. If those people support you and you get into power, why would you want at the first opportunity to get rid of them or to take away their jobs? And those are the kinds of dynamics that are at play in determining how do you fund a country that for years, for the last 10 years, have been spending beyond its capacity to earn revenue. And therefore, um, last point on this. I have often said that when we talk in diversification um, discussion, we miss out a piece. The piece that we miss out is that for diversification to work, you need to cap expenditure. You cannot be in an energy um, a revenue situation where your margins are 55% because that's what you tax them anyhow. And you are increasing your expenditure over and above that capacity and expect that you will be able to do something else with the other goods and services. It doesn't work quite that way. So the first thing that has to happen is that you have to ensure that your expenditure is kept at a level that is sustainable. And usually that should be on the basis of the revenue stream that you are able to, to, to have. Trinidad and Tobago is not in that space. We have about $10 billion over. And, and therefore that's the challenge with bringing new things on board because notwithstanding everything that everybody's asking for, you do not have 
the money to deal with it unless you decide to cause some individuals who currently I enjoy a particular uh, a benefit not to have it anymore. That, that's just the other part is. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and we're happy that you're able to, to complete those, those thoughts. I'm going to jump straight to, to Antonio. Um, again, the, the question is, is this this idea of consultation and consultation across the board of different stakeholders? And, and where, where does Tutor, um, I'm not asking you to speak on behalf of the whole labor movement, but maybe you can share some views uh, from a labor perspective on this question. So I just want to tie that in with um, the issue of planning that I raised earlier. Understanding, as, as was said, that there are headings, there are figures, and sometimes, as we alluded to, those figures are artificially supported. Just permit me the example. The Ministry of Education, like I said, we are looking at a plan for the Ministry of Education in terms of its manpower. Good. There are X thousand teachers in the system some of whom are at the secondary level. When we recognized that some years ago that there were certain subjects in the secondary schools that students were not inclined to do or where the population was diminishing, we started to recognize that certain schools tended to move away from offering those subjects and therefore the request for subject teachers in those areas dwindled. So a perfect example will be, again, the CVQ subjects, the tech work subjects, for example, plumbing and masonry, et cetera. Now, remember, bearing in mind what Conrad said, that your wages and expenditure will be fixed. Even though you don't have a per person, a body in that position, the vacancy is there, and therefore your expenditure still caters for that position. What we have found happening, and this is where we talk about the lack of consultation and the lack of planning, you are suggesting that you want to do away with the position. For example, in a bid to reduce your expenditure and doing away with the position without looking, for example, at what the CXC's offerings are, and therefore, what kind of teachers do I need? In what subject areas do I need education professionals? In the secondary level. So is that good planning and our is that based on consultation and our position is no. So when you are looking at that and you just want to plug in the figures to fit the headings, that's one thing. But taking it back again to the previous point about the strategic goals and the development goals, we have to look at what we want to accomplish. And we are saying that is where the consultation comes in with the RMUs and the, and the sectors. And we have not seen that as tutor because when that manpower audit was done at the secondary level, tutor proffered certain recommendations, especially in certain subject areas. And we do not think that those things have been taken seriously. And we are seeing the fallout now where, as we talk about recovery, again, those skilled workers coming out of the tech work field, they're gonna have a shortage of that in the next three years or so. So that is an issue where we feel needs to have greater consultation as far as planning for the education sector goes. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, and, and definitely, you know, we're gonna to have to have um, a lot more of these discussions because obviously uh, giving persons 10 minutes to, to ventilate some of these things is, is clearly not enough time. Um, and, and we really want to try to create a space where we can have, you know, um, proper understanding of, of what these things mean to the particular sector and allow people a space to, to speak. I, I want to take leave as the moderator just to add one point to this particular part of stakeholder, and that has to do with uh, intersectionality of vulnerable sectors, um, including youth, women, and how you do stakeholder consultations with those groups in particular, because you have to remember that even as youth, as women and so on, they function in different spaces and therefore um, having youth or women in this space, in the consultation space, and they, they represent only one grouping, uh, you, you've really not uh, done as much as you could and you still end up with the same problem of, of not uh, aligning your representation, um, representation of the document that, that eventually comes out. And really, I think that the if I'm hearing persons um, in particular 
uh, Gabriel and, and, and Antonia, it's about having a consultation, not at the point necessarily of the balancing of the budget, but the consultation which goes to uh, set, setting up the framework for the establishment of the document. And I think that that is perhaps the key, the key that is coming out in the, in the conversation. So I want to ask a, a double barrel question here. And that has to it. We are a year in. Um, the financial year is almost an, to an end. Uh, we had a budget read last year. How do we feel about the government's rollout of that budget statement? Um, how do we feel? Do we think that enough was done? And, and of course, we're operating in a very, very precarious situation with with COVID-19, but do you think that the budget uh, from the last budget that we've read was able to really respond to some of the challenges that we were presented with? And what do you think needed to be done a little differently? And I, I wanna start again with, with Connor. So it's, it's two parts. Do you think that the budget uh, really responded to the circumstances well? And what do you think should have been done uh, differently? So the, the first thing is that I think you know, last year was a strange year because you had this abomination called COVID-19 that came in uh, and that created a whole new dynamic for all of us. And I don't even think that we are able to get it done right because even as we speak now, there are some challenges that we have in the workplace as it relates to one, people who are currently take or people who have had the load for the last year and a half are tired. They, are, they, they really need support. But on the other hand, you cannot bring out people who are unvaccinated and put them in that environment because we've seen what the impact of that is. So we find ourselves in a situation where the rollout of the budget, for example, would have been constrained by the, the availability of individuals within the system to deliver. That's, a, that's, that's new. Um, and I think, you know, whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, if you ask the question around providing what you think the solution is, but the population in large measure say, no, they don't think so. How do you move beyond that? How do you evaluate that? How do you deal with that? In the context of trying to move forward, but recognizing that on the basis of the experiences that you have seen around, if you go in a particular direction, you put everybody at risk. I think, I think from the, that perspective, I would argue that given the constraints that were available, the best possible job was done. And the results of that we would see when the minister speaks on Monday to talk about what has been accomplished and what has not been accomplished. And, and from where I sit at this point in time, it's difficult to make a judgment without that knowledge. So let me stay there for you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Gabriel, same question. Um, remind me the question again, Atkin, sorry. So I am asking, uh, given the challenges that we would have faced in the last year, um, what is your view on the rollout of the last budget statement? And, and um, are there things that you think could have been done differently? So, as, as Conrad said, we have to understand that the, the financial year 2021 was an abnormal year as it has been throughout the world. Um, you know, we had reached out early to the, 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 the government and we had identified, and, and it's interesting because we can learn best practices around the world. Um, we, had, we had told the government that if they could do something to create aggregate demand, if they could use some of the funding to drive activity, it would help to numb the impact on the vulnerable businesses and citizens. Unfortunately, that was not done to, at all. In other words, there was, there was no money put in to keep those small businesses operating with their, or to very little to put in vulnerable. But, I mean, businesses got nothing. Um, vulnerable citizens got very little. What you are seeing today, and I heard the finance minister say this year, that his tax collections were down, his back collections were down, but that is, the, that is the outcome of not putting money into the system. 
we have to understand that the largest beneficiary of money in the system is the government. And just to clarify, as Conrad said, Every time you buy something that's not a basic food, the government gets back. Every time a business makes a dollar in profit, the government gets 30%. Every time an employee gets salary, the government gets 30% or 25%, as the case may be. So by, by stifling the economy, the money, the aggregate demand in the market was down. And the government is now seeing that. Now, it is, it is counterintuitive when you don't have money to spend because the economy is bad, that something like the proclamation of the Procurement Act would not be done. Uh, you, have read, you have read many times that the Procurement Act could save this country $5 billion a year. We actually have a procurement regulator sitting, I think, we're in, in the same building Mr. Elliott's office was in with I think 50% of the staff there who sitting there doing nothing, doing nothing because we have not, we have not proclaimed the procurement act. The procurement act would save this country. So why, if you don't have money, why would you not want to implement the procurement act? Now, we have talked about the fact that at Trinidad, because a country has not been, we have too many people that are not any tax net. So that is a reality we have to deal with. And thank God they have passed, they have passed something. We need to make sure, we need to make sure there's a taxpayer's bill of rights. And when I say taxpayers, I mean every single person. So that we don't end up with the government taking advantage of taxpayers um, in this environment. So in terms of did the government do the right thing with the budget, the reality is it was very difficult for them. But I am disappointed that. A, that the bookkeeping the priority over the strategy, because it's very easy. Any bookkeeper says, I have no money, so they don't spend. But you need, you need a strategist, a, a, a financial controller, to say, I need to earn money. I'm going to invest money, put it into the market, generate activity, create demand, and I will earn taxes. So that is, that is, I think, sums up my, my, my concern with the budget. And I'm hoping that we look at it this year. Now, at one point I want to raise, the transfers and subsidies are, are a major issue. They are a major issue. And they are, they are a group of citizens, and this ID card or some mechanism to know who are vulnerable. This country, in many, every country in the world knows I, 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 have, I have a cousin who lives in Canada. The government knows what her salary is, and they know that she has to get a rebate on her energy bill because she can't afford to pay the proper rate for energy. But the person who can pay the proper rate for energy pays it. So I agree these transfers and subsidies are inefficiently used because you are subsidizing the wealthy and the poor. And that, I want to be very clear, from a business community, the business community is willing to pay the right rate for water, power, the, the, the competitive rate. But because we have an inefficient government mechanism, they can't apply these subsidies where they should be applied. And that is, I think, another gap that the government needs to deal with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I, can I, can, I guess, can I sure. just ask Gabriel something? Yes. Yeah, sure. So you made a no, you made a you made a correct point about the government gets income from the business community from POI and all that. But if I look at the expenditure that the government has and I looked at the revenue, it really doesn't match. There is a gap. Correct. I guess my question, my question is. The other side of the story, should is, is your view, therefore, that the government should reduce it, like its expenditure rather than borrow to support the current expenditure? Now, the issues around um, efficiency and those kinds of issues, in some instances, cannot happen in the current construct. And it cannot happen because there is a requirement for legislation and a number of different things. But there's also another requirement. There's a requirement for individuals to change their perspective on what work is and, and the relationship with the gov a government job. So what would you suggest, you know, as, as, as a way 
around that, given the fact that you are correct in what you are saying, but there's another side of the story, which is that there is not sufficient of the revenues at this point in time to meet some of the demands that have been even day to day. Okay, so I'm glad you asked your question and uh, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the panel's um, uh, indulgence. One, I said that the Procurement Act, and it was, it was stated, would save the country $5 billion. So we need to understand that why would you have a procurement regulator in an office on, in whatever tower you are there, it used to be in, and not have it operating? That's one. That's one way to save money. You know, the other way to earn money is to, is to ensure that the, the population, the population is taxed properly. The, the one thing the, the Trinidad Tobago, one thing the Trinidad Tobago Chamber stands for is every business entity, every individual, every politician, everybody needs to pay their tax. That's the law. That's, that's, that, that, that's what we have to do. We have to pay our taxes. So collecting, if we collected more taxes, and if we save money, and created, so we have a heritage of civilization for now, money, that money is being taken and put into the general fund, but I don't know how it's used to to drive activity. As far as I know, it's been used to, to cover expenses. So the opportunity, I believe, is that we, the government says we have to drive exports, but every time somebody exports, they have a back refund, the government is not paying them their back refund. So we are actually having counterintuitive activities that are destroying the activity that the country needs to really transform. Right. That, that's me. but so the fact is you are saying there's a shortfall in income. I after it's too much expenditure, get the procurement that cooperating, get tax operating, and and narrow that gap. That's my input. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I, I want to, I actually want to continue this a little bit, but I want to ask Antonio to come into the conversation. Um, so again, you know, we, we we're looking at uh, how. How do you think the government's last budget has has read? Um, how has it played out in in the current context? And and there's a question that I want to ask after to, to all the panelists based on the, the uh, interaction that was just taking place. Well, if I could um, start the interaction first, if if I if I can. Um, Absolutely. I'm listening to what is being said, and, and yes, really and truly, many of us in Trinidad and Tobago have to learn now, or have had to learn to stop living champagne lifestyle and more being income. So I was saying along those lines. The reality is that as a society, we have to stop looking only to the government for management of expenditure and revenue as a country. We have an individual responsibility as well. Simple things by way of our spending and to take it to education now. Many of us shop online. Oh, we love to shop online. But what is happening there? Isn't, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, isn't that Forex leaving Trinidad and Tobago? Isn't that funds leaving Trinidad and Tobago that could have been better utilized in our small and micro enterprises where we are teaching young people to be entrepreneurs, where we are given women, especially those who are in vulnerable situations, the opportunities to earn income, and we support those businesses. So incentivizing is not only at the big level with the big companies and middle-sized companies. We need to move now, especially in this recovery period, to the micro and small entrepreneurs and keep the foreign exchange inside here. Also on the issue of education, we as educators did not see the disbursement of funds allocated by the budget for certain activities in a timely manner. For example, one of the projects that was projected for fiscal year was the provision of MiFi devices to students and to schools to assist connectivity. Whatever the reason, we are only now hearing about that when it was projected to start in the first quarter of the next fiscal year, and that would have helped so many students. However, give jackets jacket, when you reach the mid-year review, you saw the large injection of funds into the health sector. 
to improve our capacity to deal with the pandemic situation. But at the end of the day, let us look at education in terms of its contribution to income generation in Trinidad and Tobago. We have a number of us who utilize external education providers for tertiary education. So the fees we pay go outside. We have high quality personnel, not so Atkins, in our tertiary institutions who can deliver programs of comparable quality, indigenous to our context, to build Trinidad and Tobago. Let us invest in those. And so as part of allocation of funds to education, let us look at it in those contexts, please. Um, so I will side with Conrad and not pass judgment on the rollout, but just to share those perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and definitely, I want to I wanna do two things before we go any further. I want to say to you all that we're definitely going to have a conversation after the budget is read. So I'd hope that a few of you all are available. But more specifically, I think there's some of the issues that we've raised that require some very specific attention. Um, of course, education being where I am now um, is, is a very specific one. The last thing that I want to ask to our panelists, and this, this has to do with um, coming out of the conversation, did we miss an opportunity and, and is it too late? Given that the country was had to grind almost to a halt, did we miss an opportunity to hit a reset button at that point to do a few things a little differently? Because when we talk about reduction in expenditure, there was a lot of expenditure, even on a personal level for a lot of individuals that just disappeared because you, you, your, your activities had been reduced significantly. Several things had been reduced and therefore uh, a lot of expenditure had been, had been reduced significantly. Did we, in your opinions, did we miss an opportunity to hit a reset button and perhaps when we, start, when we started to reopen, we could have been reopening with a very different view or a transformative view of how we how we do things. Uh, Conrad, you can start. You're muted. I think first of all, it was not an opportunity. It was a hurricane. It was something that basically came upon us and hit us, and we had to respond. Um, having said that. I think that even today, as we speak, we, we really don't have an opportunity. Now, let me put that a different way. A lot of companies have had to change the way in which they did business, interacted, had employees, had meetings, and those kind of things. And I think that those companies who had plans and who had aspirations of being better were, in fact, able to roll forward somebody thinking that they would have had in the future. So for example, in the NGC group, we had a plan 20 years down the road to get involved in artificial intelligence and a number of things. When this occurred and we suddenly realized that you couldn't do the things that you would normally do, a lot of, a lot of that thinking came to the present. And as a result of that, you were able to run your business successfully and to get back to a state of normal with different arrangements. But that was at an individual level. Uh, in some instances, in some institutions, they did absolutely nothing. They simply sat down and said, okay, let me see when this will, will, will occur. And I'm afraid that, you know, they're not gonna be around in the future because um, they've gone too far and the momentum that is required to move forward and the opportunities have just gone. So the answer to your question is, I don't think that this was an opportunity that we could have used differently because it fundamentally restricted our ability to do commerce, to support business activity, to support economic activity, but at the same time, you had to ensure in many instances that without that revenue stream, you had to carry the cost 
because it's people that you're dealing with. So I, I don't see it quite that way. I see it as an opportunity for individuals and those individuals who would have accepted it and who are planned for it and who are the resources to deal with it and the bandwidth to deal with it um, would at least help us through the transition because we do need some amount of companies and some amount of uh, success to transition because the next two years are going to be interesting ones. Um, the revenue streams are going to start to inch back up a little bit. The borrowings are going to be a little bit less if you want to maintain the same situation, but I'm afraid that two years forward, unless some decisions and some conversations that are taking place now are successful, we would have a difficult time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabrielle? Um, so to a certain extent, I agree um, with Conrad. Um, th this came like a thief in the night. It's not a, um, what we thought COVID would be, COVID changed, the Delta variant has changed it. But what's interesting is that you look at economies and, you know, we try to always say we better than this one or we better than that one. But I, as a, I, I, I was born in, I grew up in Rodney and Besso Street behind the bridge. I went to Bethlehem and Boys Archery School. I grew up upstairs of a, of a rum shop, right? My father had a rum shop. And I, I always looked at what the opportunity was. How do I create an opportunity out of this? And what I saw happen in many, many developed markets with strategic action is they actually, their, their, their stock markets have boomed. The price of property, the price of houses in, in, in many of these markets have, 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 have gone dramatically, have, gone, have increased dramatically. You know why? What the government did is the government, and unfortunately it's difficult to try that, I want to say that, but what the government did is they tried to keep the economy turning at some level rather than pulling back. That money that was put into the system, the consumers, because they were not spending as much, they actually saved more. And as they, as they had confidence, because a big part of our economy success is built on confidence, as they, as they realized that, that the economy is strong, they're investing, they're buying. So the activity that gives rise to income tax, VAT, PAYE, and so on, is occurring, and those economies are booming. So, yeah, I think we missed an opportunity because I don't think we saw, rather than looking at the bookkeeper's perspective, that A, one minus one equals zero. And so, somebody else saying, how can I make 110? So that was, that's the weakness we had. I think we lost an opportunity because all of those people who were not in our, in our tax system or in the informal system, we had an opportunity to bring those people into the formal system. I'm telling them if you if you are not registered, remember there was the issue of if you didn't have if you don't have an NS number, you you you, you couldn't get um what do you call it? Salary grants? Grants. What what we should have done is says you don't have an NS number, but register now, get your employer to set you up. We know you're not employed today, but we now know who you are, we now know where you work, and we're gonna so we could have now taken thousands of informal workers and brought them into the formal system. We could have done the same with businesses. So I think we missed an opportunity. That's my, um, that's my perspective on it. But again, I am an eternal optimist because I come from the private sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thanks, thanks for that. So I wanna, I wanna turn over to Antonio, Antonio now um, to give us uh, the, last, the last few words on, on this panel here. Glass half full, I agree with Gabriel, that's for glass half full. And you always should be looking at it like that, both individually and collectively. Um, yes, we missed an opportunity, just as he said, to bring in those persons and reduce the, the vulnerability of some. However, when you look at other jurisdictions and how those states have recovered or are recovering, you notice that their budgeting or approach to budgeting is no longer using that cash mechanism as a cash accounting mechanism. But you're also doing two things. One, you're planning for your next fiscal year, whatever 
under whatever headings, but you're also developing a resilience plan. And I think that's becoming a word as you have in the theme there for the forum, that's becoming a word we are using that many of us are conceptualizing how it can be implemented. And we talk about building resilience into the, into the education system, for example, regionally and internationally, as well as locally. Building resilience by having those additional plans would give us a second layer, colleagues, of recovery mechanisms as we go forward. So I would pause there, because I know we're running out of time and you're getting a little buzz in your ear, but um, it was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you very much for those words. And let me just say that um, while we think that this, this challenge was unique to Trinidad and Tobago, um, I have been attending some of those UNCTAD meetings and let me tell you, it is, it is the same. Um, you're hearing the same discussions from, from many members of civil society, uh, small business members who've been taking part in some of the exercises. And I have no doubt that when the ministerial start next week, um, you'll be hearing some of the same in terms of some of the challenges that uh, all countries had faced. So I want to thank all of you for uh, being with us. I want you, those of you who are viewing online to stay with us. We're just going to take a 30 second break and then come back with our second panel. So I want to thank again, Conrad, Gabriel, and Antonio for being with us. As I said, you are free to stay on in the in the second panel if you have if you have the time, um, so that at the end of it, you know, we can we can get some some additional comments from you so thank thank you again and and um i have i do have to mention though um to gabriel that my grandmother lived on uh rodney street so maybe we'll have to talk about that uh, <laughs> at another time <laughs> all right okay so thank you thank you so much uh for your contributions and we're looking forward now to vanish james and ozzy warwick so we'll be back with you in just about 30 seconds or so
very much again to our last panel. And thank you for those of you who are online listening to us and viewing us on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, thanks for staying with us. So we're into the second part now. And on the panel, we have uh, Ozzy Warwick, General Secretary of the Joint Trade Union Movement, and Dr. Vanus James, uh, economist. And these are two specific, they represent two specific sectors that we felt needed a little more space and a little more time. Uh, so in particular, the question of Tobago and how does Tobago factor in to all of this? Because a lot of times um, we tend to, to treat with Tobago as a, um, a by the way, as a, oh yes, we have Tobago as well. So it, it's important for us to always, when we're doing these things, ensure that we treat with the question of Tobago as a partner um, in this and not, you know, a little brother that we, we sometimes want to forget. So I want to hand over now. Um, so I'll ask Ozzy to start off with a few words and a brief introduction, five, six minutes, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Vanus to, to do his part as well. So Ozzy, floor is yours. Yes, and thank you very much, um, Akins, for having me. Um, on this very important pre-budget discussion. And I did it, was able to actually listen to your uh, the first panel and I thought that that uh, really was quite interesting. It raised quite a number of interesting points. I guess I wanna start off by saying that this country and the people of Trinidad and Tobago cannot bear any more burden on, of economic adjustment. They cannot bear any more neoliberal policies by this government. It is just too much to bear. I, I wanna start off there because you see, when we have in a discussion about budgets, I have been around for, for some time and as you know, OWT hosts a post-budget forum. So every year it's a, a rango tango over revenue and expenditure. In other words, you hear the same buzzwords. You hear budget deficit, you hear that, the um, budget is pegged to the price of oil and gas. And then you hear that transfers and subsidies is a problem. It's, that is always coined as a problem, but nobody gets into the details of it. And you know what is left out, Akins? You, the people themselves. A budget is not an abstract thing. And a, and a, a budget is not some myth mythological construct somewhere in skies. It is it has to do with a person's ability to buy, to live, to consume, to survive. In other words, it is about the reproduction of daily life. And I want that to be central because from our point of view, this particular budget, 2021 to 2022, must be a people-centered budget, especially in light of the current hardship Akins that people are experience, that people have been experiencing, vast majority of people. So I am very concerned that we get into uh, some sort of debate over how do we uh, deal with the budget deficit and use lingo and language and terminology that does not in any way um, allow ordinary people who have to survive, who have to think of how do they reproduce their daily life, what does that mean for them? And that brings me um, to this concept of participatory budgeting. It's something we have always been advocating for because it allows citizens whose, whose life, who the reproduction of their daily life, which is impacted by this budget, um, can be involved in the decision-making around how funds are allocated, how, how can uh, we build the productive capacity of our country? How can we build the industrial capacity of our country, the technological capacity of our country? And you see with participatory budgeting, you really allow the opportunity for the country to achieve social justice as a foundation. In other words, Akis, this, you see this particular budget, we had a crossroads here, and here's the crossroads. It has to do with the concept of the role of the state. Would this PNM government take this country, continue to take this country down a road of neoliberal policies where you strip away the role of the state more and more and more, and what we are left with really 
is a bunch of political managers of capital, but the ownership of that capital continues to be more and more in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And if we had adopted a participatory budgeting process, then, and I will hear from my brother, uh, Dr. James in a bit, then we would have the, a greater inclusion and involvement of the people of Tobago, because we are now talking about the reproduction of daily life of every single citizen in this country. And that's where I want to lay, lay as my foundation for this discussion. How do we address the reproduction of daily life of each and every one of our citizens, especially, especially um, our vulnerable? persons who are the lower end of the economic brackets, the single moms, the single fathers, all right, people who are earning minimum wages, people whose little wage that they have is way below what is expected of them to meet their means of subsistence, to survive. You know, we talk about the budget, about a, a revenue and expenditure. Let me tell you something. Uh, there are thousands of our citizens are dealing with that revenue and expenditure dilemma many of them trying to figure out how am I going to pay rent? Do I cut down on food in order to pay, um, pay my rent this month? Uh, if my, one of my child gets sick, how am I going to find the funds to pay for that child? School is opening. Where do I find the funds to pay for school books, pay for school administration fee and so on? This is where I want to locate um, our position in terms of labor, reproduction of daily life, we, the citizens cannot take any more neoliberal policies and that it must be a people-centered budget. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ozzy. As, as usual, on point, um, very focused. Um, I think we, we're very clear on what uh, Jayton's position is, uh, people-centered. And of course, there must be some kind of consideration for the uh, current hardships that we're all uh, having to endure. At this, at this point in time. And I think that's something that came up in the last panel as well, that we are not in normal times and therefore um, perhaps we need to consider that significantly as we have our discussions and deliberations. So I wanna turn over now to Dr. Vanish, James, economist. So we wanna get from you, you know, your opening comments and then we get into our, into our discussion. All right, thanks, Ekins. Um, I live in speak from the perspective of the interests of Tobago in the country's larger uh, path to progress. Um, I think Trinidad and Tobago today faces uh, two sets of problems uh, that motivate the way we approach the budget. The first is that um, COVID-19 has come along and uh, decimated cash inflows pretty much for everybody. Businesses, households, workers, as uh, Ozzy is talking about, and so on. Uh, and um, in a way, government is the, is the biggest engine we have that could do the, the borrowing and the cash injections required to address that massive cash uh, stall. Uh, I think in the last year, <clears throat> government has done a, a, an awful job of uh, helping the nation grapple with this effective demand crisis that has been created by COVID-19. And I hope it will clean up its act in this budget coming. <clears throat> I would have thoughts on that if we, if we get that fine the discussion. But the other problem uh, predated COVID and in fact predated independence. It's the problem of development that we've long had. We've inherited a whole series of problems that uh, are linked to the fact that our capital stock in the country, our stock of, of assets that we use to produce income is inadequate to the challenges we face, uh, creating full employment for everybody, diversifying exports and allowing us to make uh, uh, a competitive foray into global markets in order to pay for the imports we need. And we inherited a basket of institutions of collaboration among ourselves that are inadequate to the task of solving those two sets of problems. So um, we need to have a, a conversation about how to deal with the, the, the effective demand challenges 
And we also need a more serious conversation about how to deal with the development challenges. One thing I can tell you is that the solution to both problems simultaneously lie in solving the development problems. And in particular, in building capacity to produce capital in the country and uh, use that to restructure our economies and uh, make our way in the world. It is in that sense that Tobago has a stake in the country. Uh, over the decades since independence, uh, Tobago's potential to contribute to that transformation of the national economy has been uh, neglected. There are economies in the Caribbean that do not rely on oil and gas, that outperform Trinidad and Tobago just because of the type of approach they have to solving the development problem. Tobago is a key to adopting that alternative approach, but the country isn't designed really as we still have it now to exploit that potential that Tobago really sits on. Uh, in order to exploit the Tobago potential, unfortunately perhaps, we're going to have to reform the way we govern to get what Ozzy is calling participatory budgeting. We can't govern with the type of government we have in place today and get what Ozzy wants to, to get us participatory budgeting. Uh, as it stands now, what the government does is it calls on those who maybe funds its, its, its political activities and so on, call on friends, call on people they know, and uh, they listen to those people and get their suggestions and, they, and that passes for consultations on the budget. But what we really need is to have a parliamentary design in which the non-executive members of the parliament outnumber by far the executive members of the parliament and they can run budgetary committees, oversight committees of one sort or the other and call the public in when, uh, as a parliament, when the budget time comes around to hear from the public, maybe three, four months before the budget is laid uh, by, by the executive, uh, to hear from the public what its priorities are from the business community, from the households, from whoever wants to come and speak to the parliament and instruct the parliament as to what we want to do. That's representative government at its best. We are not designed with representative government. We're designed with a an executive style uh, authoritarian government. And therefore you really don't have a framework in which you could get the participatory budgeting we need in order to exploit properly the potential of uh, say an economy like Tobago to transform the national economy and respond to problems like the COVID demand crisis adequately. Uh, let me just give you two quick examples of economies that exist in the region currently now that do not have this enormous COVID-driven uh, crisis, uh, notwithstanding the fact that they do not rely on oil. Yes, one of them is Bermuda, and the other is the Cayman Islands. Bermuda produces 117,000 US dollars per person. Trinidad and Tobago produces 18,000. Cayman Islands produces 91,000. Trinidad and Tobago produces 18,000. Tobago produces 4.2, $4,200 per capita every year. Now, in order to move in the direction in which you could use the potential of a Tobago in order to uh, get us up to the, the 91 and 100,000 uh, US dollars per capita annually, you're going to have to reform the foundations of government, provide for the equal status and self-determination that we need in Tobago to exploit our potential for development, and, um, and in that context, transform the way the national economy works so that we are not as dependent on oil and gas as uh, we currently are. And if we did that, we would then find ourselves in a position where the revenues could be generated to underwrite the, the transformation, to validate the transformation, where the savings could be generated internally to underwrite the transformation of the economy over time and uh, the, the, the particular form of the crisis that we face today, we would not face either from a development standpoint or from a cash flow effective demand standpoint. So that's the context in which I think we ought to be having a serious discussion about the way Tobago fits into the national development landscape and the national uh, opportunity to deal with 
crises like COVID, like the 2009 fiscal crisis, uh, financial crisis, and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, for those words. Uh, so, Ozzy, uh, the, way, the way we want to do this is I really want to have more of a discussion than a, um, I think you saw what was happening in the last, in the last panel. Um, based on both of your presentations, there's an interesting thing that arises, and that has to do with structure and framework. Um, I know that the joint trade union movement um, several years ago had put forward an alternative plan for development called LEAP. So I, I want you perhaps, Ozzy, to identify um, some of the key things that, that, that the labor movement had pointed to in terms of approaching the question of development from a Trinidad and Tobago level that um, Dr. James was talking about. Uh, how has the trade union movement uh, treated this question of an alternative development path for Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I wanna just go back to something Dr. James said, and I don't, I, because he said something that was very important and I don't want the, I don't want it to slip the audience. So he talked about the demand crisis, development crisis. And I would just like to add, if you don't mind, Dr. James, a leadership crisis, because to transform and to make the shift requires a certain type of leadership that just isn't there amongst our current political leaders. OK, I'm just putting that there. But you, you mentioned the question of the demand crisis. And I, I'm going to tell you why that is very important and link it back to the the most economic alternative plan, which would have been developed as far back as 2016. You see, after World War II, the global economy had focused on building demand. So it focused on the demand side of the equation. And this led to what we could call a post-World War um, social settlement, where you would have strong people's institutions, um, workers would have certain amount of rights, et cetera, all right? And then of course that gave rise further to the civil rights movement, et cetera, so that you can have, in addition to workers' rights, some uh, political rights, civic rights, et cetera. So there was a heavy focus around the demand side of the equation. However, with the, in, the, in the late 80s, or throughout the, the 80s really, with, with Reagan and, and, and Thatcher, there was this shift to the supply side of the equation. And in making that shift to the supply side of the equation, there was an attempt to, in effect, really um, roll back the gains that would have ensured that people, citizens, would have had at least some resources to reproduce their daily life, okay? But that, but that focus on the supply side led to several economic crises. One was mentioned by Dr. James, the uh, 2009 uh, crisis. I'm saying this to suggest that the Labour's economic alternative plan is suggesting that, listen, we need at this point in time to go back to the idea of the demand side. Okay? How do we ensure that we have strong people's institutions? Not just trade unions. Of course, I represent trade unions. So I will say trade unions, but I'm talking about credit unions as well. And I'm talking about finding other um, innovative institute or, or structures of ins and institutions or, or ways of organizing people so that, that there's this focus on that demand side. And in doing that, one of the things that, that Labour came up with in LEAP was the idea of an industrial development fund because we understood that the, our country uh, cannot go down the line of focusing on supply and not build our industrial capacity, build our technological capacity. And that was crucial, that was central. And I think even Faria and, 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 and Enel would be surprised that, that labor is saying that, listen, we need an industrial development fund that can ensure that businesses can have access, all right, to low interest uh, capital, so that we can, and then, and you put some conditions on that. So there's a focus on export so that we can save our precious foreign exchange because you don't want people establish businesses or going to business that just uh, take more and more foreign exchange, but that they can generate foreign exchange, that we can build the technical capacity of, of our workers, our citizens. So it's not just um, supply type jobs, but really heavy technical industrial jobs that have that that have 
um, our, our citizens be highly trained and highly skilled so that even if we have to use that skill set of our citizens, even um, as, as exports, we could do that. So the point I'm making is that Labour's economic and alternative plan was all about building the industrial capacity of the country. Now, what has happened since we submitted that in 2016? We have seen the country lose more and more its productive capacity. You know? We lost a, a, a plant, a manufacturing plant in Unilever to produce, uh, which used to produce household items. We've lost the capacity to produce our fuel. We have plants in, in Point Lisas, they are closing down. So in, it's not just in energy, but in manufacturing as well. And so we have not been able uh, to really harness the full uh, capacity of our citizens to be able to have the country focus on that demand side. And that, was, that is what LEAP was, was about. LEAP was about how do we ensure that we can generate, we can produce uh, things, not just import things, because if you focus on just supply, I mean, at some point, I believe that that is what led has led to these huge budget deficits, this re, um, misalignment. All right, but if you if we are able to focus on building productive capacity, then you realign the thing, and I believe that that also deals with the question of our development crisis, and how do we how do we see development, and how do we understand development. As, but not just in isolation, but as part of this wider Caribbean society that we exist in. So I just thought I'd share at the heart, I mean, LEAP included a number of other things, but I think one of the things that was really crucial was the establishment of the Industrial Development Fund by, because what was required there was mobilizing the liquidity within the system, you know. And if we would have done it properly, and unfortunately, you see, the governance, our governance is so poor and so bankrupt. I think that is that it, it doesn't help because you see, if it had been done in a particular way, then it would have been attractive for our for local private investments. Okay, but as we, uh, you know, in Trinidad and Tobago, you know how it goes. I, I come back to that question of leadership crisis because all of that can only be driven by astute visionary leadership, which just yeah. is not there. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for that, for that, Ozzy. Um, so I, I want to get um, Ranas in on this because one of the things that I think ha uh, came out even in the last conversation about it is, but is part of the, the collective narrative, is that some of the challenges we're facing are because of COVID. Um, but in your introduction, you you pointed to a deeper systemic, systemic problem that was only showed up by COVID. So I want you to perhaps give us some clearer examples when you talk about reorienting the developmental model for Tobago and how this could benefit uh, the, 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 the uh, generation capacity of, of Tobago. Well, since Ozzy is in the conversation too, let me also connect my answer to what he just said. No matter how much you're able to grow demand and uh, solve, say, the problems created by COVID, you'll get to a point where if your capital stock is too small and too inadequately designed, you will not be able to fully employ your labor force. And people will leave in droves. The country has one of the highest brain drains, Tobago has the highest brain drain in the world, and China and Tobago has a high one, Jamaica and so on, all across the Caribbean, you have this problem. That's because no matter the level of effective demand that you have, even if you could spin the money supply sufficiently to uh, fully employ the existing stock of capital, you will have a problem. Your export capacity would still be inadequate. Your capacity to innovate would still be inadequate. Your capacity to compete in the global marketplace would still be inadequate. And so the problem underlying COVID that predated COVID is in fact a capacity building issue. That's the way you're going to have to solve that problem. Now the question is of course, 
how do you build that capacity? So I would agree with Ozzy that you're going to have to be talking a lot about industrial restructuring. But it, what does that mean? One of the experiences of Point Lisas and one of the generic experiences of the industrialization program across the Caribbean in my lifetime is that not all forms of, well, first of all, the engine of diversification, productivity growth and development is really capital production, not manufacturing. Manufacturing is only relevant in the way Lord Caldo meant because you can produce physical capital with the manufacturing sector. But we have other forms of capacities that we use to produce output. The knowledge and skills of the workers as he represents is the single most important component of technology. And uh, we can show mathematically that uh, when you lay out models of economies like ours, the, the ratio of knowledge, skills, and self-confidence of workers to the capital contributed by capitalists must be one-to-one -one if the economy is to operate with optimal technologies. Now, how do you get that? You're going to have to build capacity to produce knowledge, skills, and self-confidence, to produce those formal financial capacity, financial capital, and so on. Those forms of capital we can produce. We can't compete with the world in making manufactured goods and services and so on. But we can compete if we put our minds to it in making knowledge, skills, and self-confidence in building adequate healthcare systems. We've proven to the world already that we're good in the creative industries, which I spent a career studying for the World Intellectual Property Organization, and so on. The general point I'm making is there are forms of capital that what we are, what economists and, and the labor movement would tend to want to call human capital, for example. There are forms of capital that we can produce, but we must be able to and put our minds to producing one form or another if we are going to be able to build viable economies in Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the Caribbean for that matter. That's what is exemplified by the fact that Cuba can now put four vaccines on the global marketplace. Were it not for the humbug of the Americans, blocking them in their participation in the world system, they would be going a long way beyond where we are going. And what Bermuda does and what Cayman Islands does is they produce financial intermediation capital for export to the rest of the world. We could produce education for export, healthcare for export, bringing students from the rest of the world to come to China to be able to go to school and so on. Now, we take a place like Britain. Britain exports 66 billion pounds of tertiary education annually. Australia, China is getting into that market and so on. Trinidad and Tobago could make a foray in there. But it, it, its best option for doing that is to exploit the potential Tobago has to export the, 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 the human capital services on the broadband. And so that's where the Tobago's, the Tobago potential comes into the picture. It, you diversify and restructure the economy uh, using the engine of capital production and the best location for housing these capital production industries in China and Tobago today is Tobago. That's the fundamental point that I was trying to make. And of course, be, behind all that is still Aziz's point about good governance. You have to reform the parliament, you have to reform the constitution in order to allow for representative government rather than cabinet government so that the people and their voices all across the table can have a say in what the priorities are to drive our development process. Let me, let me ask, um, and, and this, is for, this is for both of you, because I think Ozzy alluded, well, Ozzy took us down that line when he, when he spoke to international organizations when he spoke to the question of neoliberalism. Uh, does a domestic government uh, really have the capacity in an international playing field to make some of the transformative things that you all are talking about uh, or to do some of the transformative things that you're talking about when you have uh, international regulations which almost tend to prohibit some of the developmental agenda of SIDS in, in particular? To, to either of you. 
Well, let me, well, let me say, from the evidence we have, uh, not this is not speculative, from the evidence we have, I mean, what Bermuda and Cayman Islands did, they did under the shelter of the British government, they are British dependencies with autonomy. But if you want to export education, for example, to the rest of the world, there is no barrier. You have to work with international collaborators, of course, to get to the standard such that the rest of the world would want to come to school here rather than uh, grab your people and take them to school in the US or, 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 or in Britain. But there is no barrier to establishing a strong export-oriented tertiary education system. The thing that I saw in my lifetime in China and Tobago is that all the governments are preoccupied with educating the local population. And when we proposed a second university in 1997 for Trinidad and Tobago, which, which of course, Manning and Stretch Domas took and created UTT, we were not talking about that kind of university. We were talking about working with the rest of the world to establish a capability in Tobago to produce exportable tertiary education. We were talking about the Scarborough Hospital becoming a teaching and research center with we had ne negotiated arrangements with Johns Hopkins and Loma Linda and so on to come and team up with us to build a, a capacity to export tertiary healthcare services to the rest of the world. There is no barrier to that. The same is true with your creative industry. China and Tobago, you know, has no serious infrastructure for the carnival industry, even down there in China. But nothing is blocking you from creating a serious uh, creative industries uh, thrust in the country, building appropriate infrastructure. I mean, I, I did in 2012 a survey of the carnival industries in China. One of the best carnivals I, I visited was, was Carapa China. And Carapa China's carnival is, is, was a resuscitation of the pretty mass. And yet it was being done over the stinkest drain in China and Tobago. No infrastructure for serious carnival in the country, in San Fernando, in Puerto Spain. Anyway, you have serious infrastructure for sports, but you're not making the kind of money you could make with sports. But the money you could make with sports can't match the money you could make with these other creative industries if you provided serious uh, infrastructure and financial capital services to them to support their development. So there's no barrier there. And then finally, a, 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 there's a third component. Uh, if, if you look at what the Cayman Islands is doing, 80% of its uh, stock of housing for tourism is in 10 bedroom and 12 bedroom A-class facilities of the kind we were proposing to develop in Tobago. You could produce housing services for export. That's what's anchoring what Airbnb is doing in the world today. Now, the point is that means you have to invest in the housing stock, but you don't have to invest in housing stock by, by, by having a a authoritarian government going down the road and saying, we're going to make a deal with, with, with Marriott to come and put a big hotel in Tobago. What about those places in Mason Hall and in Charlottesville where people want to build 10 and 12 bedroom uh, A-class facilities? What we were offering in 1997 to Tobagonians was architectural and engineering subsidies, su services, subsidized services to build A-class facilities to provide this quality of housing services that you could export on the, on the tourism um, platform. So we can invest in the stock of capital we need to be able to innovate. The music industry has demonstrated that. We could do that for education. We could do that for healthcare. We would have been, if we had followed the models that we were proposing in 1997 in Tobago, we might have had the capability in place in China and Tobago, located in Tobago today, to produce vaccines. Cuba could do it. Their medical experts are not better than those of Trinidad and Tobago. They just have a different orientation. So there is no barrier in the international community. The international community is not smart enough to put in barriers to investment in these kinds of industries in the country. What is lacking here is democracy that will allow all our citizens all over the country to have a serious say in how we could push our minds towards these industries. And if you want to check on that, ask the music industry and you will see, you will hear from them that it is not that they don't have the capacity to do it. They don't have the room because of the way we govern ourselves.
to do it. Thank you very much, Ozzy. If you wanted to weigh in on this. Well, there's not much to weigh in. I think Dr. James <laughs> really gave a very comprehensive um, response. Um, and just to add that when, you know, it's something we really take for granted is the idea of the culture and creative industries, because for us, you know, everything is a lie. Everything is a joke. In other words, how, how do you transform that which seems to be the inherent um, unique talent of our citizens into really producing substantial um, capacity? And what is interesting about that, um, it, whether it's tertiary exports, culture, creative industry exports, and, and or even health and, and so on, is that it don't contribute to climate change. So, I mean, just think about that for a minute, it, that we would have a model that would, make, that would be consistent with the climate, um, in addressing the climate crisis as well. And the other thing I'd like to add, one of the things that LEAP had um, proposed was that we expand really the downstream products of our hydrocarbon. Because what we're doing is we are really just pandering, and, and I think we could use that word here, pandering to multinationals to, for them to extract our natural resources, go away with it, and use it to produce all sorts of different products that they then sell back to us, which we now have to import. I mean, that will obviously, um, uh, in, a, in an economic model like that, there is no way we will be able to ensure that we can produce the, the, and distribute, not just produce it, because I'm always very skeptical sometimes, because we could produce a lot more wealth, you know, um, Akins, uh, Dr. James, we could produce a lot, but then we have a distribution problem. So it's both the production as well as the distribution to make sure that it goes to um, those who need it the most. But we don't have the governance model against. We come back to that fundamental problem. It's just not there. We just don't have it. We have, uh, we inherited a colonial uh, political structure. Um, and as much as we talk about our independence and Republican constitution, at the end of the day, if you think about, just think of how the government operated over this last year. And I hope we'll get to that question in terms of what, um, what went wrong. It was that, it was poor political leadership. It was governed, and this is how I, I, I've, I've termed it, governing by pronouncement. So it is this idea that I am elected, notwithstanding it's only 28% of the population elect you, okay, and there's another 72%, but somehow that gave you the right, some divine right, like King Charles or Louis, the, to just pronounce to the population, we are doing X. We are doing why. Imagine, you know, we always talk about the um, the influence and power of business, but you heard Mr. Faria complain, they didn't even take him on. Just think about that for a minute. Whatever happened to the National Economic Advisory Committee of very, um, you know, um, how you could call that, well, well, well learned persons, nothing. So unless we fix that, this idea of governing by pronouncement or this political, uh, construct. You see a lot of the issues that were exp uh, exposed in the first panel and that we exposed. You see, unless we fix that, I think we would be um, in, in real difficulty to be able, because here is the darkest. If we fix that and we really are able to democratize this country in a real way, democratize not just the, the well, democratize the society as a whole, meaning from village straight up to parliament, straight to even in within the businesses. Once we have that, then we are able to deal with even some of those international forces. And I know you didn't say it, but I will say it, some of those imperialist forces that will try to push our Twin Island Republic in a particular way. We will be able to stand proud. We will be able to stand with dignity as Trinbegonians, as West Indians, as Caribbean people, to face anybody in the global world because we have products uh, that we can feel proud of that can be exported at the international market uh, in the international um, market at, at high value prices. 
so that we are not, our products and our people are not treated as just cheap cogs in this global economic uh, system. Yeah, yeah I, I think I think that you all raise an important point and I just, I just wanna ask, well, I wanna make one point, take some, some leave as, as chair. Uh, when you both speak to the question of uh, the historical context and the system of governance, there's an important thing that it was raised in the last panel. And I don't think we understand why we do things that we do. So when we do the budget debate, for example, and the budget, only the lower house has the capacity to, to vote on it. Um, there's a debate in the upper house, but it's only the lower house that can actually uh, vote, right? There's no voting at the, the upper because they're not, the Senate is not allowed to interfere with our money bill. That actually comes from the colonial, uh, that, that colonial legislative council that we had when we introduced elected members into it to prevent them from interfering with the mandate of the governor general at the time. And those are things that we have continued. So we have now adopted a position still that money bills have a really deep view of the cabinet because of the structure of the, the, uh, the parliament. So even, even as you come to parliament to debate, you don't have enough backbenchers on the government side to argue a case against what the cabinet has presented anyway. So, so it's really uh, a lot of things being done on the purview of the, of the cabinet and we have, to, we have to understand that. So we do have one question and it, 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 um, I want to just, just segue right. and close. Yes. Okay. Just, just before I get to that question, let me just make a quick intervention here because I'm not going to let even opposition politicians get away. If we don't have no budget debate. It is political posturing. That's all it is. So even members of the opposition just use it to score political points. There's That's no true. real, you know, debate. I just wanted to put that there. I, I like, I, you see, I like people to know that it's objective and it's fair. So when I'm criticizing political leadership, I'm talking about government along with opposition. I just want to- Fair enough, that. fair enough. So, the, so the question, so the question really, uh, and, and, and that, that also endorses what I said. It's really about the cabinet presenting to the parliament and, and the parliament uh, rubber stamping a, a, a position. Um, this puts us to our last uh, conversation here. Um, what do you expect to see in, in this? And what would you like to, to see? Uh, one of the questions we have is, can the population really deal with um, another change in the pricing regime for fuel. Can, can the population really deal with that at this point in time, right? So in the context of that quest, adding to that question, um, what are some of the things that you think really should be central to this presentation that's coming up on, on Monday? Well, let me, let me first jump in and agree with the general direction of Ozzy's comments as it relates to good governance and to point out that all subsequent questions, including the question you asked the uh, Akins, um, can be answered in the context of fundamental reforms of the uh, governance model that we use. And what this government has demonstrated in the last uh, year with respect to Tobago is that it does not understand the fundamental characteristics of the democracy we need if we're going to have a chance to develop our economy. We need representative government, not authoritarian cabinet government, which is what we have now. And to get representative government, the most basic reforms are of two types. One is that and, and you won't hear the Minister of Finance talking about this because his, his government is not committed in this direction. In fact, they're hostile to it by the experience with Tobago just in the last six months here. But what we need is to have a reform of the parliament so that A, in the House of Representatives, the cabinet is a tiny voting minority. And the non-cabinet members of the ruling party plus the opposition make up a vast majority of the lower house. 
so that the non-cabinet members can make coalitions around the national interests that their the uh, the constituents tell them uh, that they have. That's the, that's the first most basic reform you are going to have to have. So the cabinet can rule the parliament. The parliament could rule the cabinet. Secondly, you need the Senate to be reformed to protect minority rights, like the rights of, of Tobagonians. Tobagonians are 60,000, 65,000 people in a nation of 1.3 million. To protect the minority rights of Tobagonians, the Senate has to be reformed. It has to be, A, be elected. This appointed Senate is a big joke. It needs to be an elected Senate. And half the senators must come from Tobago and half the senators must come from Trinidad. So that you can't make any laws in Trinidad that would ride roughshod over the interests of the people of Tobago unless we agree that those laws could be. Now, if you have that, then Tobago will have equal status in the nation state of Trinidad and Tobago. We are half the country. The Senate gives protection to that half. Now, if you, if you then had that, and you provided for self-determination in the context of the baby, we would have a sufficient mechanism at our disposal to push the nation, acting on behalf of the nation, to push the nation in the direction that I was describing with respect to the transformation of the economy. And that, and that is implicit in Aziz Industrial Development Fund in a, in a kind of way, because you, you know you're going to need to provide uh, credit to the investors in the capital industries in order that they can undertake the investments to produce the capital that we need produced to transform the economy. So all of that would make sense if we made those fundamental transformations. The, the, it is in that context that you're going to then have a proper answer to the question that you pose. You can't gauge, nobody could gauge what the minister would do because he's not acting in response to mandates from the people. They're doing their own thing. You can't read them. I, I can't tell you what the minister will do on Monday. I could tell you that what he did the last time didn't make much sense of the development problems and the COVID problems that we had, but I can't tell you that he'll come on Monday and do anything more sensibly. So I have no expectations of the minister on Monday. I'll wait to see and then comment on what he does. Uh, I, I don't know what 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 Ozzy thinks, but I think I agree with Ozzy that this is all about representative government, leadership by the representatives of the people who can control the cabinet. And when you have the representatives speaking on behalf of their constituents, you will not have the charade that he is describing with respect to both government and the opposition going to parliament to grandstand because they have serious work to do to represent the views of their constituents in the parliament. Fantastic. Ozzy, I'm, I'm giving you the floor for the last five minutes there to just give us the, the closing comments as, as, as we end what I think was a fantastic uh, round of discussions. Yes, I, I thoroughly en enjoyed this conversation, um, Akins and, and Dr. James. Let me answer it this way, right? Uh, because, you know, uh, you know, this reminds me of when I was a child, how my parents used to gather around the radio on budget day with a lot of anxiety. To be honest, they got around the budget, the radio, to hear the budget with anxiety and fear. I remember that. And I remember at the end of it, the despair, the despair that was on the face of my mother and my father. And I went through that for so many years. And I think that is exactly what is going to happen on Monday that people are gonna gather around, well, not necessarily their radio, but they now have TV or their phones or whatever, with fear and anxiety, with no sense of hope. And at the end of that three grueling hours, it will be despair. They will not even feel that in the response to the budget, the opposition will mean anything to the reproduction of their daily life. So what, so I, I, and I really, I, I want to end where I start because that's the part that concerns me the most. What are people, what are the collective society expected? We have been beaten even before COVID, huh? even before COVID. Then COVID, 
complete us even more. We have no sense of certainty anymore in the future. We have no idea come after, if by Christmas, having the budget being read, fuel prices would have increased. I am not sure of tea and tech. My electricity bill is going to go up. My rent is going to go up. My water rates is going to go up. I'm not sure, but my employer is telling me, listen, things are real difficult now. You know, we might have to lay off. How am I going to continue? Where if they open back up the schools, I still study well. How am I finding the seventy dollars to pay the school bus to send my child to school? This is the thing that bothers me the most. That in 2021, as a population having gone through slavery, indentureship, colonialism, with all the technological advancements that has happened over the last 20 years, that at the end of the day. Akins Vidal, on Monday, we are going to be listening with fear and anxiety, with no sense of hope, no sense of certainty for the future. We have no idea what kind of Trinidad and Tobago we are going to have come the end of 2022. And that is my fear. Now, what do I expect? Well, let me end with this statement, what would labor do if we held the reins of power in this situation would be to do exactly what Dr. James said, engage our people, engage these businesses, engage uh, our people in the creative industry in a collective discussion to come up with a, at least a united vision for how, what Trinidad and Tobago would look like. And therefore this budget would be a contribution to put us on that road to achieve that Trinidad and Tobago where people have a decent standard of living, but even more than that, people could hold their head up high with some dignity, whether it is the single mom or whether it is a business owner. Whether it's a lecturer at Cipriani, no pun intended, I or whether it's an executive in a boardroom, whether it's a teacher in a classroom or a nurse on a ward, we are all feeling the idea would be to use this opportunity to create this sense of community, to make and shape a better future for our children. That is what. Labor would do if we held the reins of power, create hope. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for those those closing those closing words, Ozzy. And and I want to just um, at this point, you know, thank all of our panelists. Um, I think what we've been able to do here this afternoon into evening is is an example of what I think both uh, Dr. James and Ozzy have been talking about. We've had labor, we've had business, we've had Tobago, we've had um, you know, persons representing different sectors coming together and discussing and having our conversation about how they feel, what they think, what they expect, what the expectations are. And we've, we've done all of that without malice and contempt. And we've done all of that uh, letting ideas contend and having, but the problem is that this is not the decision-making space. That is what the challenge, that is what the challenge is. And until you share and open up those decision-making spaces, um, you're really not going to experience the level of democracy that uh, Dr. James has been talking about and that Ozzy has been talking about. And, and those things are really, really important. So as the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, we will continue to have these kinds of discussions. We will continue to give voice to those who um, otherwise may not be heard, as we think that that is absolutely important um, to just give space to people for them to be heard. In, you know, in a time like this, when it almost seems as if, as Ozzy says, you know, there's, there's this great level of hopelessness. And perhaps that's one of the, the most important things I think that a government ought to be doing in a, a situation like this um, is really to present the kind of leadership that gives hope to the population that uh, another kind of experience is possible in not too long, not too long future. So again, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists, Conrad Enel, Antonio, Defritas, Gabriel Faria, 
Dr. Banerjee, James, Ozzy Warwick. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for taking your time off from your busy schedule to spend some time with us this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to all those of you who have logged in and who will no doubt see this um, later this evening or into, into tomorrow morning. And we wait uh, in anticipation for what's going to happen on October 4th. And don't forget there's several post-budget forums uh, hosted on the first, on the one hand by both the uh, joint trade union movement and also you would have the Chamber of Commerce also hosting post-budget forums. So you can look out, look out for those. And we will also come back after debates have finished and the dust has settled to hear the final analysis of these, of these deliberations. So thank you very much again. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. And remember, we're still in COVID. We're not out of the woods as yet. So please stay safe and continue to do the necessary things to protect yourself and your families. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the evening.